evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the OSINT Bunker podcast. Uh, I'm Defence Geek. I'm joined this evening by my co-host, OSINT Technical, and our guest this evening is George Allison, who is the editor of the UK Defence Journal. We're going to start off this evening, I think, um, jumping straight into sort of the major news stories of the last week in the UK, um, which have been the multitude of sort of disasters within the British Armed Forces. Um, so I think we're going to start off perhaps with uh, Prince of Wales, seeing as that's probably the most recent news story. Yeah, I'm just sort of going to sit over in my corner and occasionally chime in, uh, b- because t- to be honest, I'm I'm really just wiping my brow. This isn't something that I'm going to have to talk about. <laughs> yeah, George, I, I don't know if you want to just start us off, because um, obviously you, it was yourself in the UK Defence Journal that broke the initial news about... Uh, Prince of Wales having some issues. Oh, and what issues those were. The vessel is, uh, for those who aren't aware, HMS Prince of Wales is now at anchor off the Isle of Wight after, after suffering a technical fault, which I'm sure doesn't surprise people with that ship. This is the latest setback for the vessel, and I do believe it has only spent 87 days of our first two years of service at sea. So the issue, from what I understand in it, I, th- I think they're only they have confirmed this. Basically, the propeller shaft is, for want of a better term, absolutely buggered. It, I believe, had debris caught around it, but that again, that ha- hasn't been confirmed. So she's now in a position where she's probably not going to be able to get to Recife, which uh, uh, the owner of that yard, Babcock, recently won a thirty million pounds contract to provide emergency docking services for the Queen Elizabeth class. Instead, what I'm hearing is that she's going maybe. To Amsterdam, which I'm sure the crew will absolutely hate, but it's ridiculously embarrassing for the Royal Navy. Some people will point out rightfully that these things do happen, but I think what isn't usual is that they're all happening to the one ship repeatedly. Which which in a way is arguably good because the Queen Elizabeth got away with a, a what was it, almost 20,000 I think plus mile uh, voyage without any major mechanical issues. Yeah, one of our destroyers. Oh, I can't for the life of me remember which Type Forty Five, but one ended up in dry dock in Italy because of a. I think it was a <clears throat> propulsion system breakdown. Was it daring? I don't think it was Duncan. I genuinely can't remember. I for, for writing so many articles about this, I genuinely cannot remember. Um, it was in there for most of the deployment, I think. If someone wants to correct me on that, I'm sure they will. But yeah, it was Toronto, I believe, he ended up in. Uh, HMS Diamond. That oh, was I had to Google that there. <laughs> and and obviously, propulsion systems for the Type Forty Five are, you know, infamous for being. Um, yeah. Not the most reliable. Although. I mean, they are, they are, yeah. 2010, 2012, Dauntless in 2014, Duncan in 2016. Um, I think you you were saying Diamond in 2017 as well. Um, They're obviously trying to upgrade those. But from what I understand with with Prince of Wales, um, it's the starboard uh, shaft. They think that the, the, the the actual blades on the uh the prop have been like crashed into something underwater um yeah we, we haven't seen sort of the damage yet and obviously the navy won't disclose the damage for the time being at least not until the no. ship's up and dry dock but um that's, that's quite a major issue because obviously we, this this issue must have taken place on the route out of portsmouth and famously, the government yeah. spent a ridiculous amount of money trying to uh, widen and deepen that entryway into HM uh, Naval Base Portsmouth, specifically for the carriers. So clearly something obviously was missed or the, the ship's potentially navigated to an area that's not as deep as it needs well. to be. What a lot of eagle-eyed um, people noticed is that when she was leaving Portsmouth, she was only using one propeller. Mm. There was only wake visible from that side of the ship, uh, the port side. 
So, if I remember correctly, Prince of Wales was delayed in her original departure. And now I don't know if it's it's linked, but it seems to me as if they thought, right, we'll we'll try and go, we'll see if we can manage this. And obviously, it, it's turned out that that can't be done. Maybe it has been made worse by them doing that. Maybe the original cause was some sort of debris, but. It's very difficult right now because the people who do know aren't aren't talking about it and the people who have a rough idea are telling everyone else about it. So we end up, you know, third, fourth down the line of the information, which means that we can't really give an accurate picture other than something has happened to the starboard propeller shaft. And of course, it is it has a major effect on the deployment. Um, for those not aware, Prince of Wales was en route to the Westland 22 deployment off the US East Coast, um, where the carrier was due to carry out uh, a number of sort of air exercises and training yeah. and testing evaluation programs, um, which I believe were, were due to be centred around the use of unmanned aerial vehicles and obviously the F 35B. Um, obviously, with, with this major issue with the engines now, the ship will not be deploying for the foreseeable future and that obviously poses issues for the entire uh, carrier deployability of the royal navy um as 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 we absolutely um, we only have two carriers now um which means that if one as is the case at the minute is broken down and the other one is prepping for an actual combat deployment we've got nothing for training or anything like that um an issue that obviously was reduced back with the Invincible class when we had three carriers, so we could afford to have one in dry dock, one on training, and one actually deployed operationally. Well, even in this case, um, having two carriers doesn't make a difference. One, one of the things that Prince of Wales was to do was to conduct um, shipborne roving vertical landings with F-35Bs. She's the only one of the two carriers fitted with the Bedford Array that would have made those trials possible now, so Queen Elizabeth cannot do it. Even if the vessel were available to do it, there would be no real value other than the, you know, I suppose the diplomatic and political image of sending a ship regardless, but it would be, from what I understand, the purpose of the trials to be, it would have been largely pointless. And of course, it's just one of, of several sort of as I mentioned, disasters to have struck the UK military in the last few weeks. Um, yeah. We've also had the news this week of the uh, accident uh, involving the Red Arrows, an air show in Wales, um, where Red yeah. 6 uh, was struck midair by... I, I don't think we know exactly what type of bird, do we? But um, No. A fairly, fairly large bird that smashed straight through the... Uh, canopy of, of of the aircraft and, and resulted in the jet having to make an emergency landing midway through the uh, flight demonstration um, yeah and obviously that you know particularly at a, a time when the red arrows are already short on numbers as a result of various uh, ongoing issues and scandals which I'm yeah. sure we'll talk about in a bit um, it, it, it's not great um, for the for the RAF's display team um, obviously, pleased to say that the pilot is safe and well, albeit, needless to say, quite shaken and, and, and understandably so. Um, but, yeah, yeah. it's a, an unfortunate accident and, and something that very, very rarely happens to the Red Arrows, to be fair. Um, but obviously, some, yeah. something went wrong somewhere along the line there, and, and fortunately, there was uh, no no injuries as a result of it. Well, that's the thing. There's an old saying, when it rains, it pours. I think in this case, people might jump to the conclusion that overall there is something wrong in the armed forces. I wouldn't necessarily agree, me, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. It's just that what, surrounded by an environment with Ajax, Prince of Wales, it's, it's easy to look at this and go, well, that's just you know another problem. But these things do happen. They, they're very unfortunate and luckily very rare for the Red Arrows. And of course, the Red Arrows have uh, not just had accidents, they've also had uh, an ongoing scandal, which I think, to be fair, that there's not been an awful lot said about it by senior leadership in the RAF, um, who, who no. have been notably quiet about a number of things recently. Um, 
obviously for those not aware uh, the Red Arrows lost two of their pilots earlier this year to uh, resignations and to uh, investigations um, with obviously newspaper headlines in the UK covering the uh, scandalous reports of all sorts of uh, misconduct and, and so on by personnel on the unit. Um, needless to say, it, it's never a, a, a good news story to break for any unit, but especially for you know uh, su such an internationally renowned display team. Um, it's kind of a yeah. you know a, a real downer. Um, yeah, well, they, they do represent more than the UK. They represent the RAF. They are the the elite of the elite. Although it is, it's quite scary. I think it was around 40 individuals came forward to give evidence against the, hmm. the team. Um, and from what I remember recently, correct me if I'm wrong, but military police were sent to educate the team on consent following a series of allegations. Obviously, the allegations relating to sexual assault and misogyny. Again, there's nothing official on that. That's just what the, the speculation currently is. Yeah, and, and and needless to say, that's obviously quite alarming for, you know, a, an organisation whose professional standards are expected to be so high. Um, yeah. And, you know, as you say, in light of the fact that they do represent the country, they do represent the RAF. Um, and of course, it, it, it's not just uh, the Red Arrows in the RAF that have been uh, faced by scandal recently. We've obviously also had this whole uh debacle around recruitment um and obviously the resignation yeah. of uh, a group captain in charge of recruitment following um instructions that they were given to prioritize uh minority ethnic groups and women in recruitment um and i, I think generally speaking the, the the public opinion was in agreement that this was ridiculous and that ultimately for for the armed forces regardless of any diversity quotas or whatever that might be in place ultimately we want the very best people doing the jobs because yeah you know the minute you start watering down the quality of the personnel just to meet diversity quotas suddenly you've got an issue in in in, in the war fighting ability of your armed forces uh, again it uh, Air Chief Marshal Mike Wigston has not really had an awful lot to say about that matter, um, which, you know, in light of uh, all the issues, uh, especially around training, which he was tasked with resolving and apparently are, are still not resolved and, and, and still getting worse, it's not a good look for him um, or indeed for sort of senior leaders in, in, in sort of the recruitment side of the, of the RAF either. Well, it's not. Um, the Armed Force Minister, uh, James Heapy, I, I think he said... Now, it was originally claimed that there was a pause on hiring white men mm. or, or something around those sort of terms, but Heapy said that the pause is actually, you know, offering training slots to all candidates while this is all sorted out. But if I remember correctly, he said what was that positive action to assist improving diversity levels i think that's what they were aiming for and i think that's what's what's tripped a few people up but um if i can find a quote here what do you say if there are avenues for the chief of air staff to look at positive action then that's fine and he's created himself room to do that but we must be absolutely clear that no policy is implemented so make of that what you will yeah, and, and ultimately they're saying, oh, no policy was implemented. And, well, yeah. yeah, no policy was implemented because the group captain turned around and said, no, I'm not implementing it and I'm not ordering the people under me to implement it. Um, yeah. And obviously they then resigned in protest at the, the, the fact that they'd even been told they needed to implement such a policy. Mm -hmm. And... Obviously, it's a, it's a major issue for the RAF. It's it's very well known that particularly officers and aircrew spend years waiting to actually be able to get onto a flying course after they complete their initial training at Cranwell um, to the point where a lot of the pilots, once they've got a few years in the RAF under their belt and they've flown for a few years, 
a lot of them do leave to go and fly for other organizations whether it be airlines or you know other agencies because again they you know there is obviously the pay which you know obviously in the uk at the minute we're, we're struggling financially the the topic of pay and, and the cost of living is quite a major um sort of discussion that, that's been going on now for, for quite some time but obviously the other issue is that you, you've got an organization who can't get people trained quickly enough can't get them through to the training their yeah. initial training courses quickly enough and then ultimately once they do get them trained when these people then come round to needing to do refresher courses from what i've heard that the, the refresher courses are either oversubscribed or, or, or insufficiently staffed to, to be able to actually accommodate the, the need and you know once upon a time you used to have two or three pilots per aircraft in the raf and nowadays you, you you're struggling to even get a single pilot for each jet because there just isn't enough training slots and enough training capacity and and the speed at which the training is is get you know being reached just is it is dismal frankly yeah though it all basically comes down to the spending approach doesn't it mm. you know it, it 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 really is just a a, a pounds issue I think we've probably exhausted the UK side of things. Um, technical, let's get you involved. Shall we move on to Russia, Ukraine? Maybe you can give us an oh Lord, um, yeah, break. sure. Why, why, why don't we? It, it, we, we finally get a break from uh, from talking about it for a bit, but I guess we always get driven back. Um, so. I don't know where to start. It's it's been kind of a busy few weeks. Um, war's obviously now been going on for six months. It, well, I, I say the war's been going on for six months. The war's been going on for a very very long time, but obviously it's been six months yeah. now since the the sort of proper Russian invasion in Ukraine. Um, and I think the focus this week has been around Kurzon and around a, a variety of both Ukrainian and Russian strikes um, around the area and, and indeed across the wider sort of battlefield. Yeah, so currently right now we're seeing what, well, what the UK uh, Ministry of Defense has, has called a, a counteroffensive, though um, they're unsure of if any progress has been made. Um, but what we definitely do know at this point is that the Ukrainians have increased the quantity of long-range fires aimed at strategic Russian targets um, in and around um, the city of Kyrgyzstan and Novokakova, uh, um, which lie in the Dnieper River. Um, now, these targets are incredibly important, mostly the ones on the Dnieper River, because they directly relate to the Russians' ability to actually move land vehicles across the river. Um, so we've really seen starting a few months ago or starting with the introduction of HIMARS, one of the first and most important targets of the Ukrainians um, went after in the region um, was the Antonovsky Bridge, um, which connects Kyrgyzstan uh, uh, to the rest of the, the oblast, to the rest of the province um, over the Dnipro. Um, with the effective destruction of that bridge, um, I know people have disputed it, you know, said, oh, we can just put you know, a simple crossing over it, it'll be easy. It, it's become pretty clear that the bridge is pretty much done for. Um, and so the Russians have relied on uh, pontoon ferries uh, to cross the bridge. They've, they've been, or to cross the river, they've been unable to create a, a permanent river uh, a crossing in the area. Um, the Ukrainians also recently, uh, leading up to and now during um this res this new offensive have targeted uh, the other main uh, uh, bridge at, at the dam up in Nova Um I believe imagery has been posted that seems to confirm that the bridge at the dam is impassable. Um, I, I posted a graphic and I'll put it up on screen right now um, that shows the current crossing situation um, for Russian forces in the region. Um, 
and it, it isn't great. I mean, they're limited to three pontoon ferries at this point, um, which obviously, if they need to pull forces back, um, creates a significant bottleneck, and and also creates a significant significant bottleneck if they want to put new forces in. Um, and so, Russian forces are sort of at this point where they have to decide whether or not they want to devote more troops and heavy equipments to the area um, to replace battle damage units and um, what are effectively conscript units. Be- conscript units um especially from the separatist areas being backed up by uh airborne vdv forces um in the area and and these forces have been fighting since again february um and and so there there is really a critical decision at this point that the russians will have to make about um uh, uh, devoting more assets to the the, the northern side or the, the northwestern side of the Dnipro. Um if they move more assets across and then have to pull back, there's you know there's a non-zero chance that those assets may be left behind um, on the other side of the river. So there is that big decision to make. Um, additionally, the Ukrainians have been targeting Russian command facilities, ammunition dumps. Um, basically, all these these strategic targets um, with what appears to be HIMARS fire. It's it's pretty certain that it is, um, which is sort of degrading that Russian ability to, you know, supply command and then then actually fight. Um, and and one thing to remember, I think I'll add as my last point is southern Ukraine is the one area where Ukraine has the best access to NATO intelligence, um, NATO observation aircraft, um, NATO intelligence aircraft. The um, RAF's rivet joint uh, fleet has been flying pretty consistently um, over the Black Sea, U.S. RQ-4s, and, and, and all those, those high-level uh, reconnaissance assets are, are sort of blanketing the area and giving the Ukrainians a really good idea of what the actual Russian capabilities are. Yeah, and I, I think, uh, George, you did an article about the, the up, up heat, uh, not the upheat, but the... Um, uptick in uh, rivet joint or air seeker flights by the RAF in recent months. I think, uh, if yeah. I recall correctly, the, the average used to be sort of six flights a month, and it's gone up to 18 or 20 flights a month since yeah. uh, the aircraft were deployed to assist Ukraine. They've managed to sustain a, a pretty high sortie rate for a, a fleet of three aircraft, to be perfectly honest. Um, Consistently, it's it's maybe about sixteen, seventeen per month now. It's it was higher, you know, at the start. Then there was a lull, and then it was higher again. But over the last few weeks, it seems to be reaching its its peak. So I, I'm not sure how many the RAF can actually sustain over a, a maybe they are at, operating at their maximum. But as Osent says, it's there are American um, manned and unmanned assets in the area too. So it's it's a pretty complete picture the Ukrainians must be getting. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there there are questions about how, how much the Ukrainians are actually devoting to this offensive, um, how much of it has been disinformation um, to uh, uh, try to deceive Russian, you know, forces to sort of get them to move around and get them to adjust and, and potentially scare um, conscript units and, and more demoralized regular units into you know basically attempting to flee. Um, I, I know there has been some agitation in uh, the city of Kyrgyzstan itself, um, some reports of looting and, and some reports of soldiers leaving their posts. Um, those are most likely, again, conscript forces from the, the separatist areas. Um, but, you know, there, there, there is that question about how much of that, you know, how much of the press being released by the Ukrainians is, uh, is genuine. Um, so th- that is something to just take into account uh, while watching this. Uh, let me, I got to dig up something. I, I know I have more I want to talk about, darn it. Um, uh, international aid. Uh, we saw um, a Ukrainian forces training uh, with American advisors on 105 millimeter M119 howitzers um, uh, uh, in uh, what appeared to be Poland. Um, 
Uh, now the the M one nineteen is just the L one nineteen. Um, so these are obviously going to be cross trained. Um, uh, with the the existing L one nineteens that have been delivered. Um, so again, it's it's a light howitzer. It's a fairly good asset for um for Ukrainian forces um um to have on hand. So that's 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 definitely something that we're seeing them get some international training on. Um, which, which really is, again, a, a major element of what the Ukrainian armed forces have been able to put together. Um, they've received a, a whole lot of international training and, and a lot of international assistance that allows them to regenerate forces, you know, into somewhat not a NATO standard, but, but more of a, a NATO operating style, which is certainly, as some Russian observers have even admitted, it, it, puts them at an advantage um, in the way that they're, they're able to draw upon um, their existing assets. Well, even on top of that, we're seeing quite a significant effort to increase their naval capabilities even now. If I remember correctly, yeah, uh, the UK is teaching Ukrainian personnel how to use six autonomous mine hunters. It's all part of an effort to clear the coast of Ukraine and I'm sure many listeners will be aware of the fact that the UK sold Ukraine two mine hunters, I think, with Ukrainian crews already training on one off the Scottish coast as we speak. So there is quite a concerted effort internationally to um, really bulk up Ukraine's defensive and offensive capabilities, more so, I think, than even over the last few months. Um, how, how much aid has the US actually supplied to Ukraine at this point? Like. Uh, value wise because I'm pretty sure we've seen near enough every two weeks now something like another billion dollars in aid being committed military aid yeah yeah so oh sorry go ahead George no 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 you're better placed to answer that than I, than I am please <laughs> yeah so it, it, it kind of depends on how you measure the aid structured um so there the US has probably given uh, about and and let me check the actual numbers on this um from the DOD uh let me just pull this up um because there there are two types of aids or aid right now being given to Ukraine um there's the shorter term direct aid that comes from existing US stocks and then there's the longer term aid that's actually basically the the US just it gives Ukraine um money to shop um and, and basically buy pre-allocated um, items from U.S. manufacturers and, and other manufacturers, and then they're actually produced and then sent to Ukraine. So it's more of the traditional um, procurement pipeline. Um, now, the U.S. has allocated in total under both USAI and normal um, uh, security system packages uh, $13.5 billion. Um, in, in total aid. Now, now this is somewhat misleading because it sometimes assigns dollar prices um, to donated existing units, which isn't entirely accurate um, to their real value um, or their, their real replacement value. So, uh, again, this will be something for the bean counters to actually figure out hmm. after this is all done. But the U.S. has, especially with most recent package, has sort of established that it's going to be more of a long-term provider of uh, uh, armament to Ukraine. And, and I've made this argument forever, is that most of these weapon systems were made to fight one enemy. They, these were all made to fight a land war in Europe. It's, it's not like you're going to be using, you know, Carl uh, 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 Gustav recoilless rifles um in you know uh, uh, uh island hopping in the pacific that's that's pretty unlikely the javelin isn't really a system that you're going to be using to fight a pacific war um a, a, and so you know this is this is kind of something these these weapons are doing what they were built to do they were built to engage russian tanks and they were built to engage russian assets and and they're doing that um you know it's just the u.s is doing what it's always done and it's outsourcing the work to a foreign partner it's you know it's it's kind of what we're known for yeah and obviously supplying equipment to um to to, to an ally to allow them to fight as you say it, it, it's not a new policy it's something that the americans have been doing for 
well in excess of 30 years at this point. Um, obviously, rather famously, this, it doesn't always end very well. Um, thinking just back to a year ago, where obviously the US had supplied so much equipment to the Afghan National Army um, for it to then pretty much collapse in the space of a week um, after the US withdrew from the country. Um, and I, I'm sure we can probably go on and, and list a, a whole string of other different instances where it, it, it has failed. Um, the, just supplying equipment has, has not proven to be enough over the years. Um, but as we've discussed in previous episodes of the podcast, there, there is a lot of um, sort of political discussion and, a, and a, a lack of political appetite, both in the US and, and, and indeed in the wider uh, sort of NATO space. Um, regarding actually being involved in the fighting and, and, and nations are, are far happier to provide the weapons and supplies and so on but not quite so happy to actually get boots on the ground nowadays. Yeah, I mean, and, and in fairness, at, at the end of the day, $13 billion is, is primarily a drop in the bucket for the US defense budget. It's what point two no no i think it's like 0.3 percent of the budget um so it's not really something that um that's going to make a massive difference at at the end of the day i mean the one thing we have learned at least with that is that um the u.s needs to readjust its armament production capabilities um especially for munitions um so again, that's that's something that we've learned, and and that's a good thing that we learned. We've actually, you know, figured out that we need to sort of readjust our investment in in that category, and it, it shouldn't be that expensive um, to reinvest in and re up actual capabilities um, in that. That's that's physical production. That's not R and D. That's stuff that we. Um, that, that we we've already done that we already have that investment in so that's 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 one important thing that the u.s has sort of learned from this um obviously the russians can dive into deeper existing soviet era war stocks that the u.s has either you know phased out or destroyed because you know the stuff is just too old um though the russians have also run into issues of said war stocks being a bit um unstable um and, and additionally, their their ammunition dumps spontaneously combusting after being hit by Ukrainian strikes um, hasn't exactly been helpful to their their deployment of said munitions. Um, so that 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 is one area um, where it's not so much of a dollar value as manufacturing cap- capabilities, um, though though that's something that'll have to be fixed with longer term investment. Here, anything, anything more on procurement that you guys want to talk about? Maybe on the UK side of things. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, n- there's nothing recent UK-wise, procurement-wise, that we could really sort of go into. Um, needless to say, procurement in the UK is a disastrous shambles yeah. of uh, c- civil service. Uh, well. Yeah, I, I I can't I can't think of the way to put it, but I'm sure George knows what I'm on about. How many ordnance factories are there actually remaining in the UK right now? Oh, no, that was a question. Oh, good question. Um, um, I know that there's one relatively close to me. Um, beef is near Edinburgh. Actually, there's got to be some in London, John. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 trying to. I don't know. Um. The, the UK has 13 Royal Ordnance sites spread around the country. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm honest. Yeah, there are a number that were open and then, you know, were slowly closed, especially, you know, post-war. Yeah. Um, I, I think nailing down how many actually exist is a bit of a, a, a challenge, at least at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 that, that's actually a pretty good question to research up on, it, it, but you know, the, the actual ordnance manufacturing capabilities are, are, are certainly, um, 
I, I wouldn't say lacking, but not attuned to the current situational, you know, the current situation of a more attritional warfare environment in eastern Ukraine. Um with just that, you know, heavy World War One style um artillery not duels but just constant barrages. Hmm. And and I think I think the main or the the only advantage Russia has had in that is their existing pre war stockpile. Um yeah. with with a with a slight manufacturing bonus. Um, though, as as I think a lot of people have commented on, that stockpile is is you know it's it's a bit sketchy. It's it's been sitting around for a bit now. Rapidly depleting, you know, they're firing hundreds of of, of you know shells and and rockets and stuff every day. And although I don't think the sanctions are having a huge impact on their military manufacturing capabilities, I think. They've they've got other issues, really financial issues of uh, that have been there for a, a long time, where they're perhaps not able to produce the, you know, the, the weapons in in the quantities they need to replenish their stocks. Yeah, well, I I will say on the sanctions side of things, it looks like most of the materials, um, or at least the foreign imported technology used in. Um, some of their more capable vehicles, like, say, the T-72B3 with French electronics, you know, a, a, a variety of targeting systems and, and most of the more advanced capabilities included in that package, um, you know, more the brains of the vehicle um, are unavailable now. A- a- and they aren't really going to be able to integrate a domestic replacement or a replacement from, say, China um, in the near future. And so we've seen them, you know, rely on rushing older T-62s into service to to serve with both um, regular units and some separatist units as well. So that that is something that we've sort of seen them um, draw upon. And there there really is a question of of what their war stock looks like um, of of those vehicles and and of those more advanced vehicles. Um, I mean, a lot of their vehicles in storage, um, their T-72s are, are older models like the B and, you know, the the, the, the B-1 and, and the, the OBR-89. Um, so there, there are, um, a, 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 they have a large number of tanks in reserve, but they're not modernized um, and they don't really have the facilities to modernize them. So we're sl- sort of going to slowly see um, that continue to creep in. We're going to see more of those older tanks um, sort of show up on the battlefield to replace existing losses, uh, especially if they intend to, as, and I think we, we probably should pivot to the other thing, Putin announcing um, that he ex- intends to expand uh, the existing Russian armed forces by, you know, somewhere between 100 and 200,000 um, new personnel. And, and the, the big thing there is if he intends to generate new armored units, they're going to be relying on some old equipment um, pulled out of deep storage, which I mean, yeah, if he can generate that new, um, that new existing sort of force structure, which isn't easy um, because either they're going to have to conscript to do that and then send conscripts into Ukraine, which is going to have certain political ramifications that aren't great. Um, or they're going to have to, you know, offer to uh, pay soldiers. Um, so, so more of those contract soldiers, though, they're kind of, they appear to be somewhat scraping the bottom of the barrel on that. A lot of those contract units look, um, mighty interesting with the caliber of soldier that they've, uh, brought on. Um, you know, these are, are, are typically older, um, or, or just or individuals who are less in shape um, or, or in less fighting shape. So we'll, we'll see them continue to draw upon those sort of groups of individuals that are, that are willing to take that, you know, that nice paycheck to basically, you know, go, go to Ukraine. Maybe you get killed. Maybe you don't, you know, who knows? Um, but again, a lot of those units are, are um, not exactly well-trained and, and the, the losses to Russia's, um, 
competent officer and NCO Corps, um, the, the already very small one, um, has been particularly disastrous on mo- multiple levels because those, you know, they they need those officers, as I think Rob Lee said, to generate new units. Um, uh, uh, generating these units actually needs, you, you can't just, you know, get a bunch of people together. You actually need the command structure to sort of, you know, put them into battle. And, and it's even more important with these, you know, lesser trained units. Um and a lot of those those more trained individuals, those more trained uh, uh, soldiers in a leadership position, whether or not that be the very small number of NCOs or, or the officer corps, um, has already been devoted to Ukraine or, you know, isn't really available. Um, and so generating an officer takes a, a pretty long time. Generating an NCO takes even longer. Um, so that's that's something that we're we're going to see becoming an issue if Russia intends to generate those new units. And that's all I had to say on Ukraine today. Um, I, I don't know if you wanted to jump over to uh, anything else. I suppose the, the only the other things worth mentioning are obviously Iraq is still sort of bubbling away a little bit. Um, I think they were saying something like 30 people were killed during protests in Baghdad last night. Um, uh, unfo- unfortunately, uh, as I said last episode, I- I'm not really uh, all that in tune with, with events in Iraq um, at this point, so I'm probably not best placed to uh, speak about it. But um, the, the political turmoil in the country is, is obviously still ongoing. Um, and is not really helped by Iran's continuing uh, sort of destabilizing effect in the region. Um, it, it's something that's obviously been going on for a few years now, so it's no surprise. Um, but yeah, things are still sort of bubbling away a little bit more loudly in Baghdad at the minute than uh, than they have done in in, in recent months. And it's Editor Technical back again to correct some stuff and, I guess, you know, clarify. Because that's what I do when we start talking about a rock and eventually drift away into the distance. Um, so, basically, it, it, continuing on from our discussion two weeks ago, um, uh, Satter, who is the anti-Iranian uh, uh, sort of power center in Iraq, decided that... He was going to, quote, retire again. This is like his seventh or eighth retirement from Iraqi politics. Um, and basically just accuse the entire system of being of corrupt and, you know, entire mess. Um, so his supporters stormed the Green Zone again, stormed the presidential palace, ran around, started shooting at, um, uh, from what it seemed, both security forces and uh, uh um, pro-Iranian uh, uh, militia groups. Um, there were a few militia or Iranian oriented slash backed slash pro-Iranian um, uh, party headquarters and party buildings. So that contributed to this chaotic situation in Iraq over the last 48 to 72 hours. Um, it seems to have calmed down a bit. Um, about 30 people were killed. Um, which, frankly, for the amount of fighting that there appeared to be in videos is, uh, frankly, miraculous, I would say. Um, though there's nothing really like a good Iraqi riot that, you know, 95% of the shots are fired in the air. Um, so that that is something to take into account when this happens. Uh, a, a good quantity of the shooting is performative, per se. Um, and, and a lot of this uh, political upheaval at the moment is... A combination of performative um, protesting by Sadr and his supporters um, and and the Iraqis actually legitimately or the Iranians legitimately trying to sort of seize the current Iraqi government. Um, so that'll continue to develop. I it, Sadr is most likely going to, you know, drift back in um, after this is sort of ended and he'll be, you know, back in politics as always. But that that's sort of where Iraq stands right now. And I think the the only other thing to maybe talk about briefly is uh, sort of China and and some of the news surrounding tensions out there again. Yeah, I mean, I I think similar to as you said in Iraq, it's bubbling. Um, 
were, you know, I, I don't think anything um, really has, or major has developed since the Pelosi trip. Um, obviously, Taiwan got very angry and has been um, this been in this pattern of pretty continuously harassing Taiwanese, uh, both surface and air defenses, um, you know, uh, sailing ships very close to Taiwanese territorial waters, um, flying aircraft into the Taiwanese air defense identification zone, not into Taiwanese airspace, but, but into the area that, that Taiwan, um, Taiwan's military identifies aircraft, um, so you know that they they've conducted mock attacks basically. Um, so we'll we'll probably continue to see them doing that um, in the near future as they effectively continue to harass Taiwanese defenses. Um, I I don't expect to see a major change. Um, one little uh, wiggle in the situation is there is a major typhoon um that looks like it's going to possibly hit taiwan maybe it's 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 going somewhere in between taiwan to i don't know okinawa any, anywhere in that sort of southern japanese uh, uh island chain um so that's that's something to keep an eye on just for for a potential um situational changer um in the region um, but apart from that, I, I, I don't see anything major changing in the near future. I read today that Taiwan fired a warning shot at a, a Chinese drone. Is that is that unusual? Oh, the the drone saga. The, okay, so there there's a combination. There there are Taiwanese territories um, that sit very close to the 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 Chinese mainland. Um, and these 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 Taiwanese islands are frequently harassed by a, a variety of Chinese drones because you know they're they're very close, so they can both be harassed by you know uh, uh, in Kinmen County that's that's what it is. Um, they can be harassed by quadcopters, by fixed wing drones, by by just this variety of drones. And and so when it comes to a warning shot, it, it was most likely just a shot from a rifle. Um, uh, at one of these drones that was almost certainly violating their airspace. Um, but there, there is sort of this blurred line in the area because it, it is very close to China. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, a couple of miles oh. um, off, off, the, off, the, off the Chinese coast here. Um, so that, that, is, that is one thing to, um, to take into account uh, in, in the area. Um, that that these, you know, it it it's a blurry area. Have we any major news to touch on? Um, I think we've covered everything. To be honest, there's. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I I've not exactly had much time to read the news for the last week, but I think that's pretty much everything. No, neither have I. Um, yeah, I I mean, I think we touched on the major stuff. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm 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 looking around. I I don't see anything. I mean, things have sort of been a bit streamlined. Um, just seeing, you know, any any drama. Um, uh, yeah, no, I I um. Oh, uh, yeah. Shoot, sorry. Probably should have touched on this. That just got announced a few hours ago, though. Everyone who's reading this tomorrow, yada yada. News is a bit older. Um. Uh, Iranian forces uh, uh, tried to steal a, a U.S. unmanned surface vessel um, called the Sail Drone Explorer um, on Monday in the Persian Gulf. Um, they appear to have uh, uh, basically attached it to, uh, 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 I believe it's a dry bulk cargo vessel. Um, so yeah, it's it it, it was a, a very interesting heist that they attempted to pull, um, and and U.S. forces managed to get them to you know drop it basically. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll post some photos of that, but it, you know just a, a a slightly interesting situation. Looks like it was a, a target of opportunity, um, but yeah, uh, uh, definitely interesting. And I think on that note, we are going to call it an episode. So thank you very much for listening. This has been uh, the OSINT Bunker podcast. 
uh, Season 4, Episode 6. Uh, thank you very much, George, for uh, joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. And uh, with that, we will bid you farewell, and we'll be back in about two weeks' time for another episode. Bye.